hello everyone. We are so lucky to be here with Rafi. This is actually his first time speaking publicly since the midterm elections on Tuesday. He literally stepped off a plane a few hours ago. So thank you for being here. We are so lucky. My pleasure. Um, wow, what an, what an election, historic on both sides of the aisle. What was Tuesday like for you? Did you fend off some sort of hacking attack? <laughs> what was that day like for you? Yeah, I mean, so my entire team, so the Democrats have a technology team or about 35 people that support all the campaigns up and down the ballot. And we actually were all in our headquarters in DC that day. And we had our people who worked with us on the security front. We had someone embedded within uh, DHS's war room. We had security people within our organization just watching and listening to see how everything went. Um, Good news is we didn't hear very much on that day of. Um, but remember, any sophisticated attack is not something that we're going to detect today. It's something we're going to detect a few days from now or a few weeks from now or a few months from now as we sort of go through our logs and try to understand what really happened. So we're about to start on a, a whole set of postmortems effectively on like just what happened on the days, weeks leading up to Election Day so we can really understand that question. But today you are confident you can say that the election was secure, it was safe, the DNC candidates, as far as you can tell, no Nobody had a cybersecurity incident. Again, as, as far as we can tell, no one had, one had an incident. But remember, we're also dealing with an infrastructure that's super rickety. We're dealing with foreign interference of well-funded actors that we'll probably never detect. So this is a very complicated landscape. So I'm always going to be hesitant to say, like, for sure, it didn't happen. So you deal with both the actual hacking cybersecurity, somebody getting into emails like we saw in 2016 but also with misinformation and, for example, attempts to spread misinformation about where to vote or how to vote. What keeps you up more at night, a hack or the spread of misinformation? <laughs> well, I mean, I think like hack is one of those things that we're not going to detect. Like any sophisticated actor, we're not going to actually see it happen. Whereas disinformation campaigns, we can see it happening every single day. Like one of the ones that we were just dealing with is a whole set of advertising effectively that showed up across social media that basically said, men don't bother voting, let women have their choice this time around, which is a crazy voter suppression game. So like we're trying to deal with those kind of uh, pieces of information that's out there. And so they're just blatantly visible and we have to be on the phone all the time with the social media platforms being like, we need you to take this account down. We need you to investigate this account right now so we can deal with it. Well, tell me even more about that because just a few days ago, Twitter took down 10,000 automated accounts that were posting messages discouraging people from voting or wrongly, sp wrongly spreading information about votes. It took you to flag that for them to take that down. So how do you work with these social media companies and are they doing enough? Look, I used to be an executive at a social media company. <laughs> so <better>. like, <laughs> I understand the problem that they're sort of sitting and finding themselves in is a super hard one. So I'm very sympathetic to what, what they're undergoing right now. But at the same time, no, I don't believe that they're doing enough now. I think they're doing a lot and that we should be commended for the amount of work that they're putting into it. But I think we're only 10% down a very long road in order to try to make these kind of platforms secure. Remember, the internet was not really designed in order to, to uh, fend off these type of attacks, right? Like the internet was designed as like a trusting place, a place where you can like share information, share knowledge, like find a community to work with. And it was never really meant to defend against these type of like very targeted attacks. So the social media companies have a lot of work to do. What we do on our side is we partner with a whole set of organizations. We're working with a bunch of kids out of UC Berkeley who have built machine learning algorithms to try to detect and try to mark uh, certain accounts as being potentially fraudulent or those that might be spreading information, disinformation. And then we, we contact the social media companies directly and be like, we think these ones are problematic. We need you to take a look at it. We also have slews of volunteers in every single campaign who's just watching the traffic that goes around particular cam uh, candidates and sort of helping us flag it from the field. All politics is local, so it's going to be hard to tell from a national point of view whether disinformation is happening at a local level. So we need people down there to really understand the context. And do you find the social media companies and the technology companies responsive to you? Yeah, we have pretty good partnerships with them. So we, think we can call people at Facebook. We know the people at Twitter. We know the people at Google that we can go reach out to. And they're very open and very willing to work with us. What's the number one thing you wish that these companies would do in the immediate that you think could help solve the spread? of misinformation? I mean, transparency, I think, is the thing that we need to be pushing more. And I think Facebook is obviously taking some steps down that road, like uh, listing out every single advertisement that goes on in the political space. And we need every single social media company to do the same thing. Because I think, for, in my opinion, an educated electorate is the type of electorate we want. So we want them to be able to dig into what's really going on, who's saying what, who's paying for what, and really be able to make those decisions themselves. 
Going back to the, an actual hack, um, how confident are you that you can deal, that the DNC can deal with particularly threats like a ransomware attack that locks up all of your voter information, all of your uh, somehow hacks, a fundraising platform. How confident are you in protecting those? So we've been doing a set of drills, effectively, to just see what would happen and how our team would respond, all the way up to the chair of the party and seeing, like, making sure we have all the communications in line and all the processes in line. That being said, these attacks are very hard and very difficult to both detect and to react and to plan against mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Remember that you know, we're dealing with foreign actors who are targeting the electoral process of the United States and we're in an organization which has a budget of about $100 million trying to defend the entire electoral process effectively. So like, we are vastly outgunned and we need help from the US government. We need help from the private sector in order to really pull this off. When it really comes down to the DNC itself, I think I think we have some pretty good mechanisms of doing detection at least. We have pretty good, we've exercised our ability to restore things very quickly, be able to like firewall ourselves off pretty fast. Um, and in fact, recently we've, we've even publicized that we've had a set of false alarms that we've then reacted very quickly to. And I think that shows the, like the, the posture our team is in and how willing and how fast we are and our ability to respond. Yeah, talk to me a bit about that false alarm because uh, it was reported in CNN that the DNC had uh, found a hack and it to the FBI, but it turns out that it was actually a simulation of sorts. Sure. So how did that happen, and how do you avoid something like that, a false alarm, happening again? The Democrats are organized in a very unique way. We're effectively a loose federation of parties and campaigns. Like every single campaign, every single state party in the United States doesn't report to me, doesn't report to the National Party. They're all independent organizations. And that's a good thing. Remember, politics is local. We want, we want everyone to be managing their own work out there. And the issue, though, is that um, we don't have a centralized security team. So like the DNC has the largest security team of the Democratic Party. And we've, um, we've encouraged everyone to go and do simulated attacks against themselves to understand how their organizations would react. In this one case, one of our state parties was running a simulated attack and never told us about it. And it tripped up every single one of our alarms um, to the point that we, we went through our checklist. One part of our checklist is notify law enforcement, and we did. Um, and however, once that hit the press, that particular state party raised their hand and was like, um, it was us, uh, which at least they did that so we can figure it out. Um, and then we were able to then understand how they tripped our false alarms that we can get better next time. We want to reduce that false positive rate. You talked about how difficult it is to do it yourself. Should the federal government be doing this on behalf of the political parties, or do you even want them to? I absolutely want the, the federal government doing this. Like, it's, this is not a partisan issue. Election security should be a nonpartisan issue. This is the basis of the American democracy. Um, so we definitely need the federal government to be doing it. This political climate we live in is obviously a very tenuous one. Um, so there's some questions and some trust around how the federal government could approach this. But this should be a nonpartisan issue that n should not be be managed by a 35-person technology team at the Democratic Party. Do you work with your Republican counterparts on this? The RNC also has a chief technology officer. Yeah, so sadly, we don't work with them as closely as we would like. Um, we, we definitely have, we definitely meet each other in conferences. I've talked to a bunch of their data analysts at different events, but it's not like we coordinate tightly with each other. However, we do know in our cooperation with the federal government that they've been talking to our counterparts, so at least there is a, a common place, a common ground for us to be working from. We hear from a lot of critics that the Democrats place too much blame on hacking or misinformation or Russian interference as to why they lost the 2016 election. Is that who you blame or was it just not as good of a candidate. There are a million different reasons why we, we lost in 2016, there, and it'd be unfair to blame any single one of them. It's like it's everything from misreading models to the hack to like X, Y, Z. So I think it's unfair to say there's one particular thing that caused it. Okay, um, so let's talk a little bit more about misinformation. How can you practically counter misinformation? That that one of the social media things you were talking about earlier was mention vote, let women have the chance. That's not anything, I mean, it's not telling somebody to go to the wrong polling sure. place. It's freedom of speech. We have the First Amendment in the United States. How do you practically counter that? And how do you, more importantly, practically counter, uh, for example, we saw messages going out that saying that ICE, the immigration and uh, enforcement in the United States, was going to be monitoring polling places. Yeah. So. 
let's tear that apart for a second. So like actually going to your polling place notion, like that is actually something we can combat pretty, pretty um, strongly. So if we notice that wrong polling information, polling place information is going out to the electorate, we can retarget them with proper information so that we can make sure that we bring them to the right place. In fact, the Democrats run one of the largest polling place aggregation services out there. It's actually the most accurate one because we actually have volunteers in the field uh, multiple volunteers in the field finding that information and bringing it back to us. But combating misinformation in the general case, is, again, is a really hard thing for us to do and requires a partnership with the social media companies. What we've been asking them for is being able to have transparency in what the electorate is seeing so that we can make sure that we have an opportunity to say either our perspective or what the truth might be at, the, at that given time. So it requires a lot of eyes out there. I don't actually, not even confident that this is an algorithmic problem right now. Now, this is a human problem. We need more humans reading this type of information and making judgment calls and actually slowing down the spread of particular types of information. One of the reasons why disinformation spreads so quickly is because it's so easy to just hit the retweet or the share button or like button. And potentially, one of the things we might need to do is just slow it down a bit, just slow down the spread so that people can really react to it properly and make judgment calls better. What do you mean by slow it down? So make a delay, you tweet, it takes yeah, a minute to load? Yeah, that's potentially one issue. Just slow it down. Like, <laughs> just like rate limit the, the, the rate at which something can propagate on a social media So platform. limit how quickly or how much somebody could post on social media. Make it more like the real world. You mean so that it takes you some time to actually write something out, print it out, and post it onto <laughs> the message board? And actually digest what you're reading and not just simply be reacting to it. Is this not something that artificial intelligence could play a positive role in in monitoring what people are posting? No, my, wife spends, my wife is an artificial intelligence researcher at Stanford, and she spends a lot of time working on the positive impacts of what positive, of artificial intelligence can do. And I definitely agree that this could potentially be one of those. However, it, I just don't feel like we're there right now, right? Like we deal with, like we have a constitutionally mandated ship dates. Like every single year there's an election in the United States, and we need to figure out how to have a long-term plan and how to like layer AI, layer data science, layer all this work into it, and not just simply be reacting and racing to all the different elections. Okay, social media companies are private companies. They're trying to make money. Do you trust them to do this the right way, or do you think that the governments in the United States and around the world should be regulating these more, incre increasingly regulating them but then what do you do with the First Amendment? I am very sensitive to the social media company's position right now. Um, I feel that the incentive structure for them is incorrect and that they're not, they're currently incentivized for engagement and they're incentivized for making money, like you say. I do think this requires some form of um, smarter regulation and smarter uh, incentives and oversight to be put in place over the social media companies so that, uh, especially when it comes to electoral work, some better checks and balances can be put in place. And I think you can still do this in a world where you maintain the First Amendment. I think there are still clearly things that are incorrect out there to get propagated too quickly or are clearly meant to be deceiving the electorate that the opposite side or a different perspective should be allowed to engage with them. So do you want the governments to get more involved, regulate, putting some heavy fines on them that aren't just a few hundred thousand dollars, but actually are hurt the bottom line? Yes, I do want smarter regulation on top of social media companies. Okay. Um, yesterday, Tony Blair and Brad Smith talked about how there needs to be coordination and partnership between, the Europe, between Europe and the U.S. and around the world on exactly this. Um, and mostly in the face of China, we talk about Russia a lot. What about China? Are you afraid of what China is doing? I'm worried about what everyone is doing right now. I feel that like, you know, my number one job is to make sure that Americans get the right information, we can do voter outreach correctly, and our elections are safe and secure, and that we can trust the results coming out of that. So anyone who might be tampering, whether it be a foreign national government like China, which yes, I am concerned about what they might be up to in the space, or what might be any domestic, uh, domestic actors that might be targeting, or what might potentially be people just doing script, script jobs on their computer and attacking our, our election system. I'm worried about every single level there. But yes, I think this world, the, like I said before, the internet is a very um, a dangerous place right now. It's not designed for the kind of things that are happening to it. So I am worried about them. Um, are th are you increasingly also concerned about the lack of trust in our institutions? And if you're trying to counter misinformation with the truth, if people don't trust the politicians, if they don't trust the government, if they don't trust the media, 
how can you counter misinformation in a good way? Yeah, I mean, this is an issue we deal with at DNC all the time because we are the longest lived political party in the world right now. So like the Democrats is, are this institution that we're trying to get effectively new voters to trust us in, have millennials trust the work that we're doing and things like that. And I think what it really comes down to is just having um, engaging and resonant candidates out there who are talking about the work we're doing in a positive way and making and sort of like engaging the younger community, engaging the world in the kinds of work that we're doing with a positive message and not a fearful message. And I think that a lot of people are biased toward trusting those more positive messages and being more engageful. We have an international audience here from all over the world. It's not just the United States that deals with these sorts of questions about cybersecurity and misinformation. Are you working with international partners and what are you telling them? I mean, a lot of times people look to the US if the US is having problems with them. Is there hope? for the rest of the world? I obviously think there's hope. I do think actually technology is one of the paths forward. I think that being able to set up really good systems to understand how voters are, how voters are thinking, to engage them properly, to make sure our systems are secure, I do think that we can plot a path forward. It's like if we even just take the election process itself, I think open source software, verifiable pa paper trails uh, are, are some of our paths forward, and we can tell a positive story about making sure that we deploy technology in a way that that actually benefits all of us and actually encourages us all to speak in a way that we know can be counted and be assured upon. You talked about how the DNC and how all of the elections work are sort of this confederation of all these different, uh, different states and different operations. Why is that? Why can't it all just be, it would make it so much easier if it's all the same? Yeah, I mean, like centralization might make some certain things easier, but for us, we really believe politics is local. So we really want to, like, we really are trying to push for a diversity of thought within our party, and we want to be that big tent in a lot of ways. So we actually want to empower states and counties and local candidates to make their own decisions. What we want to do, however, is provide them a good infrastructure and a strong platform by which they can work on top of and not have to reinvent the wheel every single time. But like, I don't, it's not my job, and in fact, I don't have a perspective of what you should be doing in Texas versus Illinois. Like, I can tell you a lot about California, and if in fact, I can tell you a lot about the Bay Area in California, not necessarily Southern California. So I don't think you want a national organization dictating what everything should be done at the local level. You need to be more empowering because then you also might have some really great ideas. We see this today. We manage a Slack channel of every single voter file manager and data director in every single state right now within the, so we can see them and talk to them on a daily basis at the national party. And if Minnesota has a really great idea, we try to make sure that idea gets connected to Virginia. So we want to make sure sure that these really great ideas flow through and it doesn't have to come from a centralized point of view. Rafi, we are unfortunately out of time, but thank you so much it's my pleasure. for joining us so soon after the election. And stick around, there's a lot more great talks coming up. Thanks all.